Hi everybody, my name is Stephen Lynn Bell. Thank you for joining us again this week. Uh, a bit of introduction, I am originally from Gallenberg, that's my hometown, Pi Beta Phi Elementary School, Gallenberg Pittman High School. I grew up on Baskins Creek Road, and that's one of the neighborhoods that was really kind of completely devastated by the wildfire of 2016. It's all very sad for me to even think about it or to drive back up that road. I used to know where everybody lived in every house when I was growing up, but eventually I gravitated to Knoxville. I spent the last 20 years uh, in Knoxville working for Imes Nature Center as an environmental naturalist, an interpretive naturalist, and taught a lot of kids and adults various classes and programs and even hikes about uh, birds primarily. That's my major topic. But also frogs and snakes and anything else that we might find. So that's where I worked for uh, 20 years, we retired a couple of years ago, and I also have written three books for the University of Tennessee Press. The first one was called Natural Histories, and it's really a book that kind of combines natural history and human history of East Tennessee. Uh, so I really talk about a lot of the um, our own history, Native American history, Cherokee history in that book, and tie it into natural things like, say, River Cane. And the second book was, uh, I left Tennessee. The second book's about uh, the Ivory Bill Woodpecker, the Ghost Birds, but its central character is a man named uh, James T. Tanner, Jim Tanner. He received the first Audubon Fellowship grant to study uh, an endangered, uh, but of course back then they were called vanishing species, a bird that we thought we were getting ready to lose. And so we spent three years working on his dissertation, driving and camping through the swamps of the South, looking for the ivory billed woodpecker. And if you follow your conservation news, you know that just last two months ago, um, it was declared that the ivory bill is indeed extinct. Although it's not through all the processes that could be reversed, but it's, it certainly looks like the ivory bill was extinct but it was not extinct in the 1930s when Jim was looking for them. And the entire book takes place in the 1930s, what was going on, not only with Jim and the Ivory Bill, but with conservation issues. We were becoming more aware of what we needed to do and what we needed to save, what, were, what was in trouble. And then the third book is Ephemeral by Nature. I really look for uh, plants and animals that have a, an ephemeral quality. They're here one minute and gone the next. They kind of float in and out of our lives in some ways, and then they're gone. Say, monarch butterflies is one of my favorite topics. You look out in your backyard and see a monarch one day, but you don't see it again. And now we know if it's in the fall, it may be on a long distance flight, maybe flying to Mexico. That's an incredible thing to think about. So that's, uh, that's uh, the third book. Everything's ephemeral. Well, everything is ephemeral. Anyway, today we've got a very interesting topic, absolutely one of my favorites. We're going to be talking about owls. I love owls. I've worked with owls. I've taken, helped taking care of injured owls and, um, and owls that never could recover from their injury. Uh, that's a barred owl that uh, I've worked with at Heinz for many years. But we're going to look at kind of owlology 101. How are owls different? They're incredibly different than just about all of the birds. First off, they have silent flight. When an owl flies at night, say it's swooping down from a tree to grab that mouse, the mouse never hears it. Other birds have a sharp blade as a, on their wings. A crow, even a hawk, will make a noise that a mouse can pick up but an owl's feathers, its wing feathers, its secondary primary feathers are soft, they're serrated, and so it creates no sound. So when it's whooping down, you don't hear it. If you're a mouse, you don't, you don't know danger's coming. So that's the first really trick uh, they have up their sleeves. Secondly, they have absolutely incredible vision. Uh, you think, tend to think of an owl as sitting up in a tree, thinking wise thoughts, solving world problems, for how do we come up with world peace, those kind of big lofty topics. Now, 
their entire skull is basically housing for their two eyeballs. The back of the, their back, their, their one portion of their brain, which does kind of match ours, is the occipital lobe. It's back here on the very back of the um, uh, brain. It is there to interpret what they see primarily. And if you look there at the eye sockets, the eyes are huge. And an owl's eye is pretty much shaped like a pear. What we see, what, what we see in the photograph is really just a small end of the pear. That's what's pulling that, that's what's gathering the light. But the back of the eye is all retina, it's filled with cones. So even the tiniest detail, even in dim light, they can't see in total darkness, but the light is very dim. They can still see it simply by those incredibly large eyes and the unique shape of the eyes. So they see incredibly well at night, and that's their niche. Most of there's a few that hunt during the day, but most hunt at night. You would never, ever, ever know they're there. You don't hear them, uh, and you would never, and that you don't hear their wing beats either. The other thing about them, and good, this is true with good many of them, not all, but look at that face. It's a, it's round. It, it has a, a, a ring of stiff feathers that channels sound into their face. Uh, they've got that facial ruff, which is very reminiscent of a satellite dish. And so when they are out at night, out the top of the trees, they will hear the tiniest little noise. And they will, when they hear it, they turn to look in that direction. It's because their whole face is built to interpret, to pull in sound. And here's a uh, drawing. The other interesting thing about an owl's eye, ear, excuse me, is they're offset. They're not level like mine are. See, mine are, well, more or less, <laughs> more or less level. Maybe they're not. But anyway, for an owl, they're off center. And what that does for them is when they hear something, they can pinpoint it in space and time. So they, they are able to turn and look and figure out exactly where it's at. If I hear something, I do a 360 trying to figure out where the sound comes from. So uh, that's the difference in their ears, their eyes, and that's how they're so unique uh, to hunt at night, to be very successful at night, which is one reason it's really kind of hard for us to observe them because they're most active at night. During the day, they tend to be tucked away and hidden somewhere asleep. Uh, they have a unique digestive system. They, don't, they swallow their food quickly in large hunks. It's not pretty to think about, but they do. Ripping apart that poor little mouse and swallowing it in hunks. And their stomach really does the chewing, and the stomach will squeeze and squeeze all the nutrition out of the mouse. And then they uh, regurgitate a pellet. That's the pellet of a, a great horned owl. And you can see it next to my house key. There's where I put my house key. I'm always losing it. Anyway, uh, great horned owl pellet. Uh, and what's in the pellet are bones and hair. Birds, that's the two parts they cannot digest. Now, a vulture can digest that too. A vulture has such strong stomach acids, it just everything passes through the vulture. But for an owl, it has to regurgitate. So once it's, once it's had its meal, it's got to go sit somewhere and digest and then uh, kind of upchuck the pellet. One of the things I love to do at Ainz with the kids is we would uh, dissect an owl pellet. And this owl pellet is wrapped in aluminum foil. That's because before the kids would even, uh, before I would take it in for the class, I would bake uh, the pellets in the oven, I think around 350, I forget, to, to, to kill any possible germ or bacteria that might be in it. And you know, it makes the house smell like burnt hair. The whole house smells like burnt hair. But that's just one way to get to the end. And then when the kids, they would love to do this, I would give them a, a toothpick as an official dissecting tool. They would wear uh, sterile gloves too, to make it look very official. And they would break it all apart to find the, bo the bones of whatever, the, whatever that owl had eaten just before the pellet came out. Sometimes they would find uh, an intact skull, and that would just thrill them to death. And, uh, and 
I generally let them take them home and put them in a plastic bag. Yeah, here's your, here's your souvenir of the day. Anyway, that's uh, owl digestion, the unique part about that. Now we're going to look at the Tennessee species. There's not that many species to uh, have to learn. So you can really get very good on your owls just and knowing where they're at and what to look for. Who's first? Ah, uh -huh, the big one. This is the great horned owl. Absolutely an incredible predator. Uh, one of their nicknames is Flying Tiger. They are intense. They are fierce. And I've, taken, I've helped care for a couple of injured ones. And they are mad. They stay mad. They don't like being injured. Some species of birds kind of settle into a life of injury, of captivity, where they're going to be taking care of the rest of their lives, and they're okay with it. Great horned owls are. <laughs> they don't like it. Anyway, I, uh, they're all called great horned owls. Those are not ear tufts. They're not horns either. Those are just tufts of feathers that it can lift up to either help it blend in, uh, camouflage it, or to be intense looking. Look at that photograph. That's, that's creepy. Their ears, again, are on the side of their head, so uh, just like me. And who's awake? That's the mnemonic to remember them. You'll be hearing them this time of year. Actually, they do start courtship in November, De November, December. By now, early January, um, they're already probably on the nest because this is the first bird in the calendar year to lay eggs and get, get the whole process started. But the mnemonic you'll hear is, who's awake? Me too. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho. And if it's a courting pair, you'll see, you'll hear uh, its partner. The male has a little deeper voice in this case. Who's awake? Me too. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho. And then you'll hear that answer back. Ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho. That's the male and female communicating with each other. And you typically do start to hear that call if you live out in the country, the great horned owls really need woodland. They need several acres, unlike some of the others. They want to they wanna be lost in the woods if they can, but um, that's the sound you listen for is, who's awake? Me too. I love this photograph. They only weigh three pounds, 3.1 pounds. That's kind of the average weight of a great horned owl. I've held them. They're not that heavy, but intense. <laughs> They are intense, but I love the photograph. Look at the feet. Great horned owls, it is said, I've never witnessed this, but it, I've read it multiple places, can fly down and kill and grab a skunk, which weighs more than three pounds, and then lift it off the ground and fly up to the tree to tear it apart and feed it to the young ones. And as you may guess, it stinks, it smells, because it's a skunk and it's trying to protect itself. But as a general rule, birds really don't have a good, they, birds don't have a good sense of smell. I also have a great, uh, great vision, great hearing, but not a sense of smell. So they really don't care about the smell. So they'll fly up and tear it apart and feed all the young ones. They typically have roughly three young ones stand again. She's probably on the, on, on the nest right now and he's probably out finding food to bring to his mate and for himself, and then in time he'll be feeding the whole family. Uh, and it, and they, it takes a long period for them to grow up, so it's probably one reason they start so early. They don't have that much competition for the food that's out there. So that's a great horned owl. Here's a photograph of me taking care of one at Imes. And this one, um, this one was older. It was elderly and had lost some of its intensity. In fact, you can see I, the way I'm having to hold it there. I really had one hand behind its back because it was losing the ability to perch and stand up. It was just older, probably 16 to 18 years old. We didn't quite know how long it was, old it was. It eventually passed of old age. But that uh, gives you a sense of how big they are um, and gives you a sense what my former job was like. It was wonderful. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's me. Uh, with a great horned owl. This is one we rescued in Seymour. This was this is kind of an interesting story in that it was a Saturday many many winters ago. It was a Saturday and we got a phone call at Imes that there was a, an owl had become impaled on a barbed wire fence in Seymour and so 
Uh, Pam Pecosus, who was the wildlife, she was in charge of all wildlife at Imes, and I drove out to see if we could rescue it. And this is what we found. The poor owl had probably become impaled. Um, this does have a happy ending. Uh, probably became impaled at night, flying low over the ground after a mouse, and didn't even see the bob wire until he got banged into it. And that one wing that looks flipped over was, it was basically a, one of the barbs was caught in its uh, kind of armpit, wing pit. And, but luckily the strands of bob wire were spaced just well up far enough that the owl could stand on the bottom run. So it wasn't just hanging there by its wing. And we got there, but it was, it could not free itself. There was no way it could have freed itself without really doing some serious damage. We moved in. I grabbed the legs of the owl behind, uh, from the back, and the poor thing was so tired it just sat down on the back of my hands, boom, and Pam was able to move in from the front and lift the wing and move a little pen knife, cut away the feathers and some tiny bit of flesh that was uh, actually uh, caught, and we took it to um, UT Veterinary Hospital down on uh, down on Cumberland or down on Neyland Drive and it wasn't that badly injured. It went from there to a rehabber out in Clinton, Katie and Carrie out at the Clinch River Raptor Center and they kept it for uh, a few weeks just to watch it and see if it was okay and they finally decided it was perfectly well. They could come back and they called me and I went uh, met um, Katie I think it was at UT. The owl was in a cardboard box and I was going to drive it back to Seymour and let it go at the same field. And <laughs> what I remember most about this story, the, the box had holes in it about that big, and the owl had that, yeah, I had that yellow eye staring at me the entire way. He was going, get me out of this box and I'll rip you to pieces. It did not. I did get him out of the box and he flew away. But if you do have Bob wire on your property, uh, it can be a problem for not only night flying birds, but daytime birds too. It's advised that you tear some kind of marking tape uh, uh, that you use to mark off property. Just hang it along every so often so it kind of dangles in the wind and the predator flying low over the ground will see that there's actually something there. So that's a great horned owl. This is what that nest looks like. A friend of mine named Jason Dykes took this photograph. And great horned owls, no owl actually carries a stick or builds a nest. They don't know how. They have all these other talents, but that's one. That's not in. That's not in their uh, toolbox. They take. They find. And maybe another reason they great horned owls nest so early. They find a used crow's nest or a hawk's nest that's still real, relatively intact, and they'll take it over. So that was one that Jason found and took a photograph of. And so again, owls do not carry sticks. That's beneath them. They'll find, in the case of great horned owls, they'll find uh, uh, um, they'll find a, a nest that's already existing. And this is what the owlets look like when they're first born, or really more later when they start venturing away from the nest uh, and get out on the branches. Uh, at that point, they're no longer called nestlings; they're called branchies. And that's a pair of great horned owl branchies out on the nest, away from the nest. Okay, here's our number two species. An absolutely, incredibly beautiful bird, a soulful bird. It's a barred owl, weighs almost half as much as the great horned owl. Gets its name barred because of it's got those brown stripes down its front. They kind of look like the bars on the jailhouse. It's got those really dark eyes. It's an absolutely uh, gorgeous bird. These birds, uh, barred owls like woods near water. So if you've got property or uh, if you're looking for one, look for, look for a pond, a creek, a wetland, and that's where they are, will probably be living or hunting and maybe even nesting uh, because their primary food is cold-blooded animals. They'll eat, they'll eat a mouse, but they really are searching for all on the water. They're searching for crawdads, salamanders, frog, oh dear enough. When spring, when we get the spring peepers to crank up in February and there's hundreds of frogs, I'm sure they're out there eating frogs, frogs, frogs. But they, um, and um, they'll eat fish if they, if the fish comes cl close enough to the surface of the water, but they can dive down and see it and grab it. So they primarily are cold blood, eating cold-blooded animals. We'll eat some more. 
Uh, but they're very common because the description of woods near water is kind of the description of East Tennessee. Most of us have some water nearby somewhere surrounded by woods. The mnemonic to remember these guys is who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all. And often that last phrase is really drawn out, or maybe it's the only part they do sing. So that's the bar out. They really start courtship about this time, about January, because typically they lay eggs in March. And so they're starting courtship. So if you live at Wizard of Water and you start hearing uh, the two barred owls talk to each other, in this case, the female has a deeper voice. She's actually heavier and just has a more deeper resonant voice. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for y'all? It's a very easy mnemonic. And that's what you'll hear right about dusk into dark or maybe early in the morning. Um, and that's what to listen for. You may have a courting pair of barred owl. Most owls mate for life, but they don't, a lot of birds that mate for life don't, well, A, they don't live that long to begin with, but some just don't make it through the entire season. So if the mated pair, something happened to one, they tend to separate because they want to go away from their home territory to find food elsewhere and not deplete their home territory. And so they separate and go different directions. Not They don't want to compete against each other either. So when they come back together over the home turf, that's when they start chatting. And one of them may not have survived for some reason. Maybe we didn't find enough food to get through the cold weather. So um, a, a new mate will be found eventually. So that's, that's barred owls. And that's really generally true of most birds that mate for an extended period. Anyway, here's another glimpse of what I used to do at Imes all those years. I love this photograph. I was, that poor barred owl, it had a very, very damaged uh, wing, just hung. He couldn't use it, couldn't move it. Uh, that owl was injured near a golf course in Nashville, as I remember the story. And so I helped take care of that owl for several years until it passed. But uh, <laughs> that's a much younger version of me too. But I love what I did there. I love the expression on the kids as they're looking at, they're not looking at me, they're looking at the owl. And they're saying, oh my goodness, I've never thought I'd be this close to an owl. That's a good look at what we do and what we did then and what they still do at home. So that's, that's me and a barred owl and I'm drawing a blank on the name of the barred owl right now. But uh, that's what I did. Now this is the current barred owl that they're taking care of there. This name I really remember because I gave it its name. Its name is Stay Puff. When this one came in, it had uh, both eyes were very, very injured. Normally, Imes doesn't treat an injured animal. Imes adopts an animal once they've been through rehab. But at the time, we had an empty enclosure uh, with no owl in it. And uh, the vets really didn't think this owl would ever be releasable, so we took it in just to see if we could nurse it back to health. Initially, both eyes were swollen shut, and we had to catch it. Our, uh, Louise Conrad was the vet in charge of that owl on staff at the time, and I would help her as would others. We would catch the bird, and I would hold or someone, and eye drops had to be dropped into both eyes. I think we'd have, you'd have to hold the back of its head and the poor bird couldn't even see. It was scared to death. It could hear but not see and uh, when I'd go into the enclosure to pick it up, that's what it would do. It would, puff, it would puff up to look absolutely as big as possible. And eventually its eyes healed. They healed but it still could not see. It only had limited vision in one eye so it could hear you come in and approach it, but it couldn't see you very well. So it would puff up um, <laughs> and look monstrously big. And so at that point, uh, I started taking it out and walking around so get used to uh, the noises of Iams and used to being on a glove. Uh, that's a photo. But unlike the great horned owl, which is mad and stayed mad, and that's kind of a rule with them when they're injured, Barn owls really become gentle. They love their heads being patted, and this uh, stay puff actually, it was a very, very gentle uh, creature. And the, 
the two or three barn owls I've worked with over the years, the same personality type, once they are in captivity, once they're being fed, and once they get used to the person, and it's really their voice, I tended to use a very soft, much softer voice with them, not a deeper voice, just so they get used to my voice. And um, it loved being, having its face and head stroked, because that's one area a uh, bird can't really clean very well. Uh, if you've got barred owls, if again, if you think you've got uh, barred owls on your property, woods and water, uh, you can help them because what they're going to need to nest is a hollow tree. They don't use a nest like the great horned owl. They don't use an old hawk nest. They want a hollow tree to live in. And woods near water, there's often sycamores, and sycamores tend to have a hollow opening in the tree. But if you don't have that, you can put up a barred owl box and it's significantly bigger than a bluebird box, but you can build them and put them up on your property. And if you have any luck, a pair of barred owls uh, may take to them, and not only will they sleep there during the day, it gives them a hiding place during the daytime when they're vulnerable. And um, you say, well, what are they vulnerable to? They're a pretty darn big owl. They're vulnerable to great horned owls. Great horned owls will swoop in and grab a barred owl. So uh, it gives them a place to hide and maybe even to raise some young ones. So that's a barred owl box. <laughs> I'd laugh every time I see this photograph. This is an eastern screech owl. It was really the first bird I ever worked with at I'm. So this goes back 23 years or longer. Gosh, where does your life go? <laughs> anyway, this is an eastern screech owl. It looks as big as Godzilla in this photograph. It was taken by a friend of mine named Jim Logan. Look at that owl. That is some, some animals are just, they're almost like Jim Henson designed them. But that's an Eastern Screech Owl. Whoop, whoop, back, back. And that's a photograph of, that was a photograph of me before I became gray. Anyway, they typically weigh five to seven ounces. They, you may, these need much smaller area property than a great horned owl. So you may have these in your backyard as long as you have some trees. Uh, so they don't need the kind of property. So as I said, most of us live woods near water and most of us have a little bit of trees around our house. So it's possible you can have a screech owl that will adopt your property. They need trees, they need mice and insects, because in the summertime they eat mostly insects. They eat cicadas and katydids and all of those insects, lunar moths and those kind of things that are up in our trees, and then they need a place to hide. So they, they need a hollow tree, or they need a hollow box too. Uh, this is one bird species we have locally that I can think of quickly that comes in two colors. There's a red face and a gray face and it has nothing to do with age. I know I became a gray phase over the years, but uh, male, some males, uh, they, it can, it's not a sign of gender, and it's not a sign of age, there's just two colors. And a red and a gray may, um, may raise a clutch, a mixed clutch of different colored owls. So that's a gray phase, a little gray phase we had at Imes that uh, I would help take care of. This, uh, this is some. This is a, one I know very well right now. This is the little owl. Its name is Dexter. I have a permit, uh, an education permit with uh, the state of Tennessee, and so I have a permit to take care of this little one. And he is incredibly injured. He's missing most of his right wing, so he cannot fly. And I will take care of him the rest of his life. And uh, typically, me, I. I feed him one mouse a day, except he fasts one day a week. So this is a little red-faced screech owl that I take care of. He lives on my screening porch in a regulation and, uh, enclosure that is uh, state inspected to make sure he's eating well and feeding well. But he, the state loves it that he stares out into acres and acres of trees, so he feels right at home. So that's little Dexter, uh, and I'll be going home in a few hours to feed him. And oh, this is a, a good friend of mine. This is uh, Michelle Campanas. She is the education coordinator at uh, UT Arboretum. We do a monthly chat, a talk on um, Zoom. And this is one we did last summer when we made screech owl boxes. So it actually shows you how we made a screech owl box and some of the tools you would need. Uh, <laughs> and we did not, 
we did not injure ourselves the entire day. We simply did not before we came close. Anyway, that's that gives you a sense of how big the owl box for a screech owl you need uh, to build. If you think you have screech owls, remember what they need are trees, food, and shelter. That's what we all need. That's the basic description of, of, of life in a habitat. And if you can build it, if you think you have screech owls, you can build a box and put it up in a tree. And if you're lucky, you'll have them and they'll stay with you. That's kind of what you, and if you're lucky, you'll look out from your back deck and go, oh my goodness, I've got somebody living in my screech owl box. And they will live in it year round because they do need a place to, uh, to hide in the daytime when they're vulnerable. Uh, and they will. Uh, and so they're there every day during the day. And then, of course, they may uh, uh, use it, to, if it's a male and female, to raise their family there. I love this photograph. That shows you how camouflaged they are. Now that's a screech owl, a gray faced screech owl that has found, uh, excuse me, that's three, I forget. That's three screech owls. Look at the photograph closely. There's three screech owls looking out of that hole in a tree. They are perfectly camouflaged to be there. You would barely, in fact, I know the photograph. I just looked down and saw the other eyeballs and the bill. So there's three screech owls hidden in that one tree. It looks like a pine to me, but I'm not sure. Uh, they are built for camouflage. And they even erect their ear tufts in part to blend in even more to what they're hiding. They really look like tree bark. So that's two different photographs of screech owls hiding in a hollow tree. Who's next? Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is what a screech owl really looks like. This is after a sudden rain. It's kind of like when you give your dog a bath, uh, you see how big the dog really is. That screech owl weighed six ounces, which is one, take three of that to make a pound of screech owl. But that's after a rain, before it's fluffed up and preened its old feathers. Um, that was, photograph was taken at Imes, and I went out to check on the birds after a very heavy rain and uh, pulled that one out just to get his photograph. And sim if someone tried to take a photograph of me when I stepped out of the shower, I think I'd have the same kind of irritated look as that screech eye. I said, why the heck are you photographing me? Put that cell phone up. Anyway, let's look at a couple more species before we run out of time. Barn owls. This is a species that was in very much decline, sadly, for a long time. <clears throat> uh, uh, it's in a different group of owls. It's the owl, famous owls with a heart-shaped face. Uh, they only weigh a pound, so it would be less than a barred owl, but more than a screech owl. So it would take, they weigh roughly the weight of three screech owls. Uh, and they live in barns. They really love to live in silos and barns, up in the rafters, up in the lofts. Before we, our ancestors came and built barns, they lived in caves. They would be more, uh, to what a name of them, we would call them a cave owl. But our barns appealed to them, similar to chimney swifts that used to nest in hollow trees, now they nest in chimney. They adapted to us, uh, so they live in barns now. But their populations dramatically dropped because they were often killed because they lived in barns and they, um, we didn't think they should be there, so we'd kill them. But now that's made, that's illegal and their numbers are growing. Their numbers, um, they were lost from the Smokies for a long time, but they were brought back to the barns that are at Cades Cove and I'm guessing they're at the barn that's at Catalucha, I don't honestly know. but. Um, now they're brought back and their numbers are growing around uh, barn owl. And I don't have a mnemonic to remember its I call. It's more, of a, it's more of a snarling hiss, something like that. Uh, and if, you've, if people say, where can I maybe go and find a barn owl? Uh, the one place I do know of is, uh, other than Cage Cove, would be a, a Seven Island State Burning Park because they have barns on that property in Silo. So I'm reasonably, uh, reasonably confident you could go there and walk the road right about twilight because that's when they're going to become active. They're an owl after all. That's where you would find a barn owl. And here's a friend of mine who worked at a nature center in uh, 
uh, North Carolina, and she had a, uh, she was take, taking care of a barn owl, so I wanted to get a photo so she'd get a sense of how big the barn uh, I've never held one. This is one owl I've never held. I'd love to someday uh, take care of a barn owl. They're absolutely such a sweet-faced owl. So that's a barn owl. They live in barns, and it's the sound they make. Kind of creepy, really. Now, this is a, a wonderful, wonderful little owl. Now, I think I may have neglected to say that the screech owl, which is tiny, and it's about the size of a can of Coca-Cola tiny, uh, northern saw-wet owls are smaller. They're actually smaller than screech owls. Where you find these at the top of the Smokies. If you really want to hear one and maybe see one, the best time would be May and, May and June, early June. Go to uh, Newfound Gap and then drive out Cleveland Stone Road and say stop at Indian Gap. And that's the original Native American route over the Smokies before we uh, found Newfound Gap, or, or created Newfound Gap. But go to Indian Gap and just sit in the grass at about dusk and listen and hope. Uh, I can't imitate them as well as this recording. So this is what you listen for for Northern Saw Wet Owl. Northern Saw Wet Owl. That's one of the most interesting and phenomenal sounds you'll hear in nature. It sounds like E.T. has landed or something. Like there's a, you're going to look up and see a saucer. Beep, 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 beep. But that's a northern song went out. And the best time to hear that is in May and June. Now you can go up there, and I've done it many times and sat in the grass and not, not hear doodly. The weather conditions are important. They like a clear, quiet night. And finding a clear, quiet night, or finding a clear night up on, uh, up on um, Newfound Gap and out uh, uh, Mount Lacan, towards Mount Lacan, anywhere along that road, finding a clear night's not easy. It tends to be very windy and cloudy at all times. But I have been up there at times and found it and heard it. So it's remarkable with that market calendars. Memorial Day weekend is a really good, uh, really good time to do that because that's right in the middle of their nesting season and a male is going to be defining his territory or maybe the male and female are going to be talking to each other with that beep, 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 beep sound. So that's northern saw wet. Look up. They weigh less than the screech owl. The screech owl was what, six ounces? This one is half of that. Uh, and this photograph was sent to me by uh, uh, Charlie Muse, who's got a permit to catch uh, northern saw wets and ban them to get a sense of their movements in the wintertime. Do they stay high or do they migrate downslope for a better chance of finding food? And we're finding they do migrate downslope. Uh, so that he sent me the photograph. This was sent to me by uh, Matthew, who also does saw wet banding in Virginia. And that'll, that gives you a sense of the two sizes. The bottom bird, and a screech owl is simply not big, it's small. But the northern saw wet above it is even smaller. So that gives you a sense of the two birds. That's a northern saw wet owl and a screech owl. Uh, and those were from Virginia. I don't even have to say a word about this photograph. This is a remarkable, it's adorable. This is a northern saw wet owl. Uh, young ones, they're, again, they're called branchies, and they're really looking at that photographer <laughs> and going, what are you doing, what are you doing? So those are young ones, probably five, six weeks old, and ventured out from the nest, and are just standing on the branches waiting for mom and dad. So that, again, uh, when an owl gets big enough to leave the, the nest box or the hollow tree, uh, they're called branches. This is the most famous northern saw wet owl in the country, maybe the world. This happened not this past Christmas, but a year earlier uh, when they cut down a tree in Maine and shipped it to Rockefeller Center to be the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center. That poor little northern saw wet owl hung on. 
even on the back of the flatbed truck, and they drove it all the way to New York City, the owl hung on. So when they got to New York and they were getting ready to lift the tree, they found it. Still hanging on, poor thing. So they gave that, uh, that, that was in all the newses. If you remember the Christmas of 2020, it was kind of a nervous Christmas for all of us with the uh, pandemic. This, this was that feel good story that was in every newspaper. And so much so that uh, someone, very, someone very clever did a children's book. The owl was named Rockefeller. It was free, a rescue from the tree, taken to a rehabber locally in New York. And check it out, it was perfectly fine. It lost weight, so they fed it a little bit and then shipped it back to Maine and let it go. So that little screech owl wrapped in somebody's sweater is back out in the wild. But there is a children's book out there. I think it's called Rockefeller, the Christmas Owl. Uh, it was very popular. I was told it's very popular this past Christmas and sold out everywhere. So that's a, the most famous northern sawwit owl in the country. Finally, we got a couple more owls that are only here in the wintertime, maybe. Uh, short-eared owl. This is a meadow owl. This is not a woodland owl. Uh, it's called short-eared because put it up on the left, it doesn't look like it has any ear tuft. But on the right, uh, you'll see when the ear tufts are erect for some reason, they're tiny, they're small, so that's why I call short-eared owl. Again, this is a meadow owl, and we do occasionally get them this time of year in January at Cates Cove, or probably, I'm guessing, maybe even Catalucci, or anywhere else with meadows. These owls feed over open meadows, open grasslands. They're not woodland owls like they were all the other ones. So you, if it's possible and the word gets out that there's shorter now in Cage Cove at this point, I haven't uh, heard, but they, uh, everyone goes to Cage Cove, goes to a Hyatt Rain, or, uh, uh, and pulls over somewhere along the way and watches for it because it's always a short-eared owl. They kind of start feeding right as the sun's going down and you'll look out over the field and there'll be what looks like a very large moth because they're really just kind of fluttering along, not very high off the ground looking for a mouse uh, or other mouse, small, old shrew, other small rodent that they can scare up to move and fly down and grab. So it's a short eared owl. You can see on the map the blue area would be quite across the entire country is where they spend their winters and then their summers are breeding grounds way up into Canada. So it's possible they're here. Uh, that's a uh, short-eared owl. And one more maybe? I have to throw this one in. It's possible. Typically not East Tennessee. I don't have any records of a snowy owl, but this is the one everyone asked me about because it's the Harry Potter owl. Uh, typically they fly south for the winter too, but they tend to stay, uh, they're tundra owls, so they don't come close to trees, so that you typically find them. I, uh, maybe in Tennessee around the national area or just north into Kentucky or any area that is large plateau or flatland and they often show up at Logan Airport, Bay, or Logan Airport in Boston but I haven't heard that they're there this year. Their numbers are dropping. This is one an owl species that's dropping but it's possible to see them in Tennessee but really not east, not the mountainous east Tennessee, more the plateau and, and anywhere uh, flat general areas like that. So there, thank you very much. And again, uh, hope you join us all for uh, the Wilderness Wildlife Week, the last week of January. We're hoping to have uh, uh, nice weather and we're hoping, and please come, there'll be a lot of wonderful presenters there and vendors there and exhibits there. So that's uh, Wilderness Wildlife Week, the last week of uh, January. And thank you very much. Have a good evening.